Today, we're gonna to look at some beautiful visuals. Hey everyone, Tino here. Welcome back to the channel. So we're gonna do a slightly different episode today. We're actually gonna look at a website that one of my friends recommended I check out. It's supposed to be visual statistic. You know, I love, it makes the learning experience much easier and it just makes a lot more sense. So um, I'm gonna check it out live and direct with you and uh, let's see what it's all about. As always, um, you know what to do, like, subscribe, I mean, it helps me, helps other people that enjoy this find it as well. And thank you to all the recent subscribers. My numbers have been going through the roof, which is really awesome. So thank you all and love the comments as well. You know, uh, I love the encouragement. There's, uh, there's really no trolls at all in the comments, which I'm sort of surprised. Maybe I'm not popular enough. So um, maybe I need more trolls that make me popular, keep the arguments going, um, you know, Bayesian versus frequentist. I don't know. Um, I got to sort of bring up some some controversial stuff, and uh, you know they'll come flocking. All right, let's have a quick look. So it's apparently called uh, seeing theory. So let's have a look. Seeing theory. All right, let's have a looky. It's supposed to be this one here. All right. Now this is nice. I really like how these little circles behind sort of tend to react to my mouse. I mean, that in itself, I could just play around with this. I mean, there's quite a lot going on just for that. So this is seeing theory. Obviously, I won't bore you with the, with the little balls you can play in your own free time. But look, a visual introduction to probability and statistics it sounds uh, right up my alley brown.edu so i'm guessing it's from brown university i don't really know much else we'll have a look at the about I'm, you know have a quick look at the about all right so you've got these four people over here um undergraduate okay let's have a quick look let's go home and let's start what are we seeing basic probability so this chapter is an introduction to the basic concepts of probability. So apparently the basic concepts are chance events, expectation and variance. Okay, let's have a look what happens. I'm gonna click that. Chance event, randomness is all around us. I love it, I love the abstract concept of that. And I think it is, it is. Life is all about uh, randomness. Obviously some believe in that stochastic process, some don't, some think it's deterministic. Your life, your path has already been set. Um, where do I sit? I don't really know, I think. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> maybe for another video. Um, probability theory is the mathematical framework that allows us to analyze chance events in a logically sound manner. Can't disagree with that. The probability of an event is a number indicating how likely that event will occur. This number is always between zero and one, where zero indicates impossibility and one indicates certainty. Pause. I sort of agree with that. Um, I think in games, or events that can be repeated, such you know dice throws and that sort of stuff. I think that that number does make sense. Um, you know that repeatability has has an implied meaning where you know repeated sampling. This is sort of what the distribution I expected to see. I think for single events, and what do I mean by that? I mean by presidential election. I mean by um things that you can only do once you cannot repeat this a like, time and time again i think the probability is either zero or one probably at the same time and see that that's the outcome it's not i can repeat and it's like a oh, 55 chance 55 chance means that if i run it 100 times 55 out of those 100 times it's going to come out you know winning positive true whatever that means but for for events that are not repeatable i don't quite like associating a probability you might have Anyway, that's anyway that's my my little opinion there. Going on a tangent, which you know I love a bit of trigonometry. Uh, classic example: probability fair coin toss. Two possible outcomes: heads or tails. Obviously, pretty straightforward. In this case, probability of flipping your head is half. Uh, actual series of coin tosses, we may get more or less. So obviously, that's a little bit of variance happens there. As the number of flips increases, the long run frequency of heads is bound to get closer and closer to 50%. Obviously, you imagine them to convert. So we've got H here, I'm guessing that's head. For an unfair or weighted coin, the two outcomes are not likely. You can change the weight distribution of the coin by dragging the true probability bars 
Okay, so we got these 50-50. Can I drag very, very nice. Uh, let's make them 50. Okay, what if I flip the coin? So flip the coin once it came out tails, 100%. So, you know, one time. That's what I was sort of talking about. You know, you can only f do this event once. It's have 100% or zero, right? I flip it again. All right, came out tails. Flip it again. Ah, came out head. So I had two tails, one head, a third, two third. Let's flip it a hundred times. It's time to stabilize another hundred times. Hundred times, hundred times, hundred times. Let's keep jamming it. Starting to approach 50-50. What if we starting to make this unbiased? Flip the coin. I'm, I'm expecting more heads and more tails. Flip it a hundred times. It should obviously approximate this on the right. I mean, that's cool. You know, it's a chance event. Um, pretty nice. I like the graph. I like that you can interact with it. I think that's really nice. I mean, you know, good, good, simple graphics. Great. Expectation. Um, expectation of random variables number that uh, attempts to capture the center of that random variable can be interpreted as a long run average. So I guess it's sort of like the, the sample mean given the distribution. More precisely, it's defined as probability weighted sum of all possible values in the random event support. Obviously you've got all these different possibilities. Like I guess here we've got a dice, you've got like a six, the weight is like a six. Uh, what is the essentially expected value for all that? So if, if I multiply one by six, two by six, and so on and so forth, obviously that's the expectations three and a half. There's no three and a half on the dice. You know, they're obviously all uh, integers, right? Um, but that's still sort of that, that expected value. If I roll the dice once, what value do I get? I had a six of expectations, three and a half, and then I have, a, if I just keep rolling, and I'll roll it a hundred times, it should converge to that blue line. Oh, I'm actually surprised it's actually quite a bit lower. I mean, that's three and a bit, I mean, I can adjust them down here. Oh yeah. So I can actually change the weights and that's pretty cool. You can change the weights and that changes the expected value in real time. So if your dice is loaded dice, you know, if you're playing against some cheaters, uh, what do you expect the dice to be? Beautiful. So that's the sort of thing at the casino it is you ideally want to be in this sort of part of the of the distribution because long term the house has the advantage right your, your the probabilities are going to converge and they have the upper hand so in the short term yes variance can be in your favor you can win at you know roulette blackjack whatever it might be right but as you play hundreds and hundreds of hands uh they have a slight advantage and that's where they get you know this is cool as well simple straightforward it's a loaded dice what's the expected right let's keep going variance. All right, so it's starting to get sort of a slightly different to slightly more advanced concepts here. So um, whereas expectations provides a measure of centrality, the variance is a random variable quantifying the spread of that random variables distribution. So that I was saying, like, what are the sort of possible values and uh, how spread out uh, are they? The variance is the average value of the square difference between the random variable and its expectation. So it looks more, sounds more complex than it is, but essentially it's taking that uh, expected value, um, the square difference between the random error and its expectation. Expectations are what we did before, and then the actual value itself, and then you sort of square it. So it gives you this this cube. Uh, sorry, this this square, right? Uh, not not cube. That would be sort of three dimensional. Uh, draw cards randomly from a deck of ten cards. As you continue drawing cards, observe that the running average of squared differences in green begins to resemble the true variance. All right. Okay. Um, so if I draw a card, I drew a five, goes there. I'm going to draw another card. It's another five. Wow. It's a chance of that. An eight. I'm going to draw another one. I'm going to draw it a hundred times. Eventually, should resemble that another hundred times. Actually, quite surprising how, even though doing this like a thousand times, not actually converging, which is really quite odd so what can i do here i can exclude the cards so that's my expected value eight right if i draw my variance is two because obviously there's less possibility the less this there's, there's less possibilities right as i have less and less cards you know if i just have 
nine and 10, the average is like nine and a half, right? But obviously the variance is gonna be tiny because there's, I can only draw nine and 10. If I include a one, that expected variance now is gonna become massive, you know, even bigger, one and 10. You could either get one of those two, average between one and 10, five sits here. Um, so let's just draw that, that should be huge. Okay. So actually seems that like the convergence is dependent on how many cards I have and actually even drawing 100 samples, 200 samples, it doesn't quite converge. So it looks like something might be off unless I'm missing something. Um, I'd expect it to be quite close to that eight and a quarter. Anyway, that was nice. Um, pretty straightforward. I like the, that you can play around with them and you know, uh, becomes very visual. Let's go to the next one. Compound probability, all right. Okay, so this chapter discusses further concepts that lie the core probability theory. Okay, set theory. We all love a bit of set theory. Um, you know, being able to include and exclude things together. So this is sort of a typical, what do you call it, like a Venn diagram. So a set, a broadly defined as a collection of objects, right? So, or A, B, C, uh, a, B, a, B, and C. In the context of probability theory, we use a set notation to specify compound events. So this event happening and that event happening, sort of interject on, onto one another and you have that sort of overlapping and that's going to be sort of your probability. We can present events as a role of even number, say, you know, two, four, six, that's your set. Two, four, six will be my um, my whole set. For this reason, it's important to be familiar with algebra, uh, the algebra of sets. So let's just look at the notation of these sets, right? The beginning sort of can be quite confusing, but once you've got that shorthand sorted, it can become quite straightforward. So use a set constructor below to build a set and then press submit. So A, intersect of B. So that's both of them sort of the probability of these two events happening here. So this area here, A union B is either or essentially. So you're adding actually these probabilities together. Obviously you've got <clears throat> this full outer circle, which doesn't allow me to sort of have any more, but um, that's essentially your probabilities is the, is the union. Um, so we can do so this a complement. So a, a uh, complement is like the not, essentially the inverse. So a complement, essentially is everything but a. So we're excluding a. I guess you can add some brackets. So we can do open bracket a uh, intersect b. So that should be this little bit in the middle. What if I do a intersect b complement? So it's everything but that little piece in the middle. I mean, that's cool. I mean, that's nice and visual. You know, once you get familiar with them, it's not really that many of them. It starts to make sense, right? So essentially um, everything but the probability of these two things happening at the same time. So, you know, it's pretty much sort of everything. Um, love it. Universal set, essentially everything. So it's just the U is like the everything. Right, this is pretty cool. All right. Um, don't really spend much time doing this sort of thing in real life, but <laughs> it's still good to sort of get this sort of basic uh, base stuff counting. All right, so this is sort of permutations and combinations. Um, quite like quite like this uh, this sort of stuff, right? So what have we got here? Surprisingly difficult to count number of sequences of sets satisfying certain conditions. For example, consider a bag of marbles uh, in which each marble is a different color. If we draw marbles one at a time from the bag without replacement, so pretty straightforward, without replacement, you're literally putting your hand in the bag, taking them out, and it doesn't go back in the bag, right? So that's very important when you're talking about uh, like sampling and you know bagging and um, um, bootstrapping, which I've got a great idea for, for a visual demonstration of bootstrapping, but that replacement or not, it really does matter. So how many different ordered sequences, permutations can these marble possibly make? So um, unordered sets combination. So choose how many marbles should contain. So if you've got four marbles, we could start with an A. How does this work? So first step, I can have four permutation. I can pick A, B, C, and D. Second step, I can have 12, because it's saying, look, I can pick A from the bag. Right, I've got A, B, C, and D. What are my other possible steps? Let's just focus on this top one. You could potentially pick B, so you'd, your sequence would be A, B. You could pick C, so your sequence would be A, C. 
and then AD. And here the order matters. So AB is unique compared to sort of uh, BA, hence why we've got we've got 12. If we had another step, we've got less less possibility. So A and B uh, have already been drawn. Our only possibilities here are C and D, right? And obviously if we go to four, we exhaust everything. Essentially every combination in every, sorry, every permutation uh, has been picked and there's uh, essentially 24 here. I'm guessing with combinations, order doesn't matter. A, B is the same as B, A. Uh, and that's why we, we, we have, um, we have less here, right? So um, we got A, our possibilities is A, B or A, C or A, D, but obviously it doesn't double up. You see this B also has a path to, to up here. So actually it's pretty beautiful. Uh, and this is sort of like, I guess like lottery numbers where they're not replacing, but the order doesn't matter in which like lottery numbers come out. Um, so pretty cool, obviously you can make it simple again. Does it sort of matter? I guess for like really big permutations, combinations, um, can start to make some sense, but you know, it's a good simple concept, quite visual. Can't move anything around, no. Next, condition, wow. Make it rain, look at that. That's that's beautiful, that's gorgeous. I really love like this visual concept, like this rain, these balls like raining down and it seems that like the initial random number has a these black balls. And once it hits one of these bars, which is probably a probability, yeah, there you go, a third, a third, a third, they change color, right? So they, this becomes, these black balls become uh, orange, here they become um, green, and here they become blue, right? Um, and that's essentially your, your, your probabilities down here. It's like a third, a third, a third. That's pretty cool. So if I make that, what can I do? I can, I, oh, I can make that bigger. No, I can, yes, I can change the size and I can actually move it around and that essentially changes these probabilities. Universe A, so it starts, everything starts with A. Conditional probability allows us to account for information we have about our system of interest. So they're already sort of passed through that. So hugely important um, conditional probability for, for Bayesian statistics, right? For example, we might observe the probability that it will rain tomorrow uh, to be smaller than the probability that it will rain tomorrow given that it is cloudy today. So that's sort of a, putting two pieces of information together which help us actually um, create like a bigger, better picture of what might actually happen. So, you know, each one of these uh, could be like an event and what we could do is like essentially compound that event happening. So if we look at the colors down here, that if, I, if you wanna look at things that pass through A and B and sort of C, there will be far fewer, right? Um, pretty, pretty interesting. Mathematically, uh, computer and condition probability amounts to shrinking a sample a space to a particular event. Obviously, uh, the the rain, I like to call it rain, these little balls, call it as you wish. They have to pass through that. So I'm sort of shrinking by that. So it has to hit A and sort of B. Obviously, we've made A huge. Oh, what have we done here? So in our rain example, instead of looking at how often it rains on any day in general, we pretend that our sample space consists, consists of only those days in which the previous day was cloudy, uh, when we determine how many of those days were raining, right? So this is, this is really nice. Uh, I love these visuals. Um, I've always thought of using these, like, you know, shooting these uh, little balls for like, you know, uniform, uniform random variables or just, you know, random variables in general. Uh, and this sort of makes uh, makes a lot of sense, right? This is clearly very uniform and uh, it's conditional on those. Beautiful, uh, amazing work. Distributions, another thing close to my heart. Let's have a look. Random variables, discrete, continuous, and central limit theory. All right, let's have a look at this. Uh, random variables. All right, so what do we do here? Formally, uh, a random variable is a function that assigns a real number to each outcome in the probability space. Define your own discrete random number for the uniform probability space on the right and sample to find the empirical distribution. Okay. Value, I'm not really sure. Click and drag to select sections of probability space. Choose a real number and then press two, submit. One.
What am I supposed to do here? Sample distrib... Ah, I've got these colors. Okay, that's starting to make sense. All right, so I've got these three colors, red, gray. This wasn't very clearly explained. Okay, uh, red, gray, and blue. And I'm just gonna keep uh, shooting my, keep shooting the, the background until I hit those colors. When I hit those colors, I'm gonna mark somewhere what color it was. And that's gonna be, so this is actually not a million miles from, I guess, MCMC, uh, you know, like Mark of Chains, uh, something of like that, or that sort of sampling algorithms where you sort of observe something and then uh, take the distribution, right? So obviously if, can I make more? I stop. So if I make this really big, that's my gray. And then, oh, what have you done? Another color. Number two, and this little one here is gonna be number three. If I sample from that, these two should be pretty similar. And obviously there's a lot of white, because uh, that's just the background. So no, this is really cool. This makes a lot of sense when you wanna sample from a distribution, but you don't know what the function is. This is exactly what you do, right? You just sort of measure something. You've got loads of examples in terms of like measuring pi. So you have a circle when it, when the, your, your little bullet comes uh, is in the circle, out the circle, you mark it, mark it each way and that you can actually measure areas and things which are, um, don't have a closed form solution. So pretty, pretty cool. Like it. This is nice. Um, this is really nice. Discrete and continuous. Um, Two, yeah, two classes across uh, two classes of probability distributions: discrete and uh, continuous. Um, what, what does that mean? So, discrete is something that has like an integer, right? So, um, units, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? So, you've got probability of those. Select the distribution. All right, so let's go Bernoulli, pretty, pretty standard. Uh, and then here we have the probability. So with with uh, with the Bernoulli, you have a, this value, this one parameter. It's a one parameter distribution, pretty easy. You have a parameter p, so it's either true or false. Um, so Bernoulli random variable takes a value of one probability p. So we've set the probability of it occurring is 27. So this down here would be 27, I'm guessing. Yeah. And essentially, one minus p, so not happening. The inverse is going to be you know one minus that, which is going to be what like 80, 83, right? Um, and that's sort of pretty much it. Oh, okay. Then this is like a cumulative distribution function, I guess, is orange. All right. And that's going to should pop to 100. Done. Easy. All right, um, this binomial distribution have a mean and again a probability. And then you can got this cumulative distribution function up and up and up. All right, very, very straightforward. What about continuous? Obviously, in general, people are more familiar with when I say distribution are usually, what do they think of? Standard, normal, right? Um, let's have a look at that. You've got a mean and a standard deviation value. I guess it's gonna be the CDF. Follow it up all the way and all the way to one. Beautiful, that's your cumulative dis distribution function. I like it. Um, this is cool. This is really, really cool. Simple, it's not crazy graphics. Obviously I love those that rain and stuff, but this is sort of, to try and understand the distribution. What's, what's student T? Um, I just standardized, so you know, C here Z, I'm sure it's tiny on your screen, but Z uh, N zero one. So distributed with normal distribution zero one, but it also has, a, a k parameter which is your new or degrees of freedom as it approaches above 20 i mean you know it goes to infinity it starts to resemble normal and it has a limit of what well, shouldn't really go as slow as one but i guess it's sort of some of the things are undefined but yeah so that's student t something a little bit more more oh, like gamma yeah gamma's cool so I like it because it's sort of just positive. Gamma distribution, um, pretty nice. Beta, let's make it a little bit nicer shaped. Beta and gamma are sort of, I like to think of them as sort of twins. They got these special characteristics. Um, yeah, nice. What else we got? 
chi squared. Yeah. Never seen a CDF of chi squared. Um, every day is a school day. Love it. Look, nice. Uh, yeah, confidence intervals. Uh, I think that'll be very visual. You could do something very cool with this. Nice. Central limit theorem. As we keep drawing something, we should approach that to uh, sample mean. So let's just go sample. What did we do? Oh, we, we drew one value from the normal, uh, from sorry, from the uniform. And obviously it's gonna average that. What if I draw, I'm gonna keep drawing. Let's go sample size, say six. Draw six, what's the average of those six? It's this value here. I'm gonna do another six going to be that if I'm then going to do many 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 draws so six random numbers average of that and take the value I'm going to do that say what's the max 50 times oh that's awesome look at that we're starting to approach so what's the, th the theoretical is obviously it's going to be that that normal uh, I wish that draw went higher than 50 maybe what if I make that bigger as well how well does it feel that line? It's not bad actually, that's pretty nice. Pretty nice. Here I can change my, um, these parameters. What distribution is that at the top? It's like uniform, but hmm, interesting. Not, not sure, um, but yeah, that's cool. I really like this. Nice, that was a real big step up in terms of like the visuals. All right, frequentist inference. There we go, here we're gonna get the, the trolls and the haters, the, the Bayesians are gonna come in and just uh, throw mud. Point estimation, there you go. This is, a, I'm, this is gonna do what I think it's gonna do, yeah. Point estimation, we're gonna throw darts, bullets, uh, doesn't matter where you, where you live, at this and then take some sort of measurement um, to, to estimate pi. You know, what's the ones inside, outside, do a little calculation, off you go. So I'm gonna just go drop a thousand samples. So just hit, 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 hit. You're gonna see whether it falls in there or not. And then you start to get an approximate uh, approximate value of pi. I mean, you could do this to the trillions of times and then get a really good estimate of pi, but I'm sure there's a, a much better way. I'm not a pi scientist, but I'm sure they've got, they've got the ways and how they get to like, uh, have a million millions of decimal places. Look, love it. Really like stuff like this. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, confidence interval, yeah. So this is around, um, you know, instead of having like a point estimator and like point estimator means look, a lot of people, when they look at probabilities, make the the mistake of, of saying, okay, what's the probability of someone being like 1.8 meters tall? It's like, well, if you want to be a pedant, which you know how I feel about those, it's actually zero. There's no probability that you're going to be exactly 180 point infinite like zeros, right? Height, right? Most of the time, you'd have to specify an interval, specify an interval. So between 179 and 181, right? You're going to get a probability of that happening, right? So this is what this does. Let's just look at normal. Makes everyone's life easier. So. That's my mu, uh, contains mu, excludes mu. So actually, what, what, what happens here? We sample five, are we gonna sample there? Does it, in you're gonna have an average. Do we hit, keep hitting the average, yes or no? So that's my confidence interval. So, and what does that do? It's gonna sample them wider. Yeah, so that's why much, much, much wider or my confidence interval around that point. Okay, so we're actually gonna make those little winglets much, much higher. Um, yeah, obviously it's gonna be much more likely that we're gonna, essentially, does it include that number? So that's really what confidence interval, you know, is most of the time you're, you're testing whether a variable is zero when you're doing betas and t-tests on those, you're going, is zero a valid number? As in like, could this possibly zero? Because you're making a point estimate, but you're going, well, Yes, it's like 1.7, but how likely is it that it's just 1.7? It's probably like I've got a bit of noise in my data. I'm not quite sure. So, well, is 1.6 a valid number? Well, probably, yeah. So how wide are we going to make this? If you include zero, it goes, oh, zero is a valid number. Well, that, that variable is pointless, right? There's, uh, you've got no, no data there. What if we pump this up to 30? Let's 
really starts to tighten our variants. Now, this is cool. This is very, very cool. I like it. Next, bootstrap. Also, big fan of bootstrap. Um, so, much of frequent testing theory in centers of good estimators. Uh, the precise distribution of these estimators, however, can be often difficult to drive analytically. Yeah, sometimes you just don't know where the data came from, right? So. Uh, the computational technique known as bootstrap provides a convenient way to estimate properties of an estimator via resampling. All right, what does this mean? I like to think of it, you get all of your observations, you put them in your, in your little bag and then you just put your hand in there and just draw on and just keep drawing it with replacements. So you draw it, look at it and say, that's my, my sample and then put it back in the bag, right? And you keep doing that at time and time again. That's, that's really all bootstrapping is. Reason is some things just can't be modeled. Um, especially in finance, especially with things like Bitcoin, where there's just no distribution that's gonna be able to, to model it. And there's no parametric distribution. So what can you do? I think bootstrapping is probably the only day, the only way. There's um, just because the numbers are so wild that um, they're gonna make be meaningless. Things like, oh, 15 standard deviation moves. Well, nah, nonsense. Anyway, let's have a quick look. Obviously, let's go for normal, makes life easier. All right, so that's our distribution. Choose a sample and resampling size and sample from the chosen distribution. So 10, I'm gonna choose 10 random numbers from this. Obviously it's gonna be most likely to pick around the mu. So I'm gonna pick those 10. Okay, so that's my, my bootstrap. So what if I do resample? Essentially I'm randomly picking from those uh, 10 numbers and the average came out as that. So what if I resample 100 times? Uh, I'm trying to estimate the error of the mean. So sample from that, sample 100 times, and I start to get a distribution around that mean. Pretty cool, love it. Next, Bayesian inference. All right, this is like right up my alley, you know, I'm a Bayesian. Got my Bayesian tattoo. Actually, no, that'd be a great one. Uh, Bayes theorem. All right, Bayes theorem. Disease. Okay, make it COVID appropriate. Uh, suppose that on your most recent visit to the doctor's office, as you do, uh, you decide to get tested for a rare disease. Um, if you are unlucky enough to receive a positive result, the logical next question is, given the test result, what is the probability that I actually have this disease? I mean, that's a very valid point. Um, because, you know, tests are, after all, not perfect and this disease is very rare so those two have to be taken into consideration right so base theorem tells us exactly how to compute this so probability of having so this is read as follows probability of having disease and this little bar means given so given that this second event has happened plus i'm going to assume is going to become a um, positive result from the test so what's the probability of me having the disease given that i have a positive result right so we actually break it down and uh, this is just essentially Bayes' theorem and it says it's actually probability of getting a positive result given you have the disease so most of the time when you get like a pregnancy test most of these examples done on pregnancy i guess they want to do it a bit more pandemic uh, pandemic special um but you know it's like oh this test is 99 percent accurate whatever it's usually this value here so uh probability that the test is positive given you have a disease that's really what you care about i care look i've actually got it so disease has happened you have the disease i do the test how accurate is the test it's this value here right so most of the time just say it's 95 percent accurate or whatever plus you actually got to multiply the probability of having the disease so this value here typically is very small it's a rare disease right so you're actually shrinking that down uh massively but you also need to see what the probability if you want to sort of standardize it probability of uh getting a positive uh result regardless right so uh as the question indicates the posterior probability of having the disease given that the test was positive depends on the prior probability of disease, P disease. Uh, think of this as the incidence of the disease in a general population, right? The set probability by dragging the bars below. So healthy, 90%, disease is actually 10%. So it's not that rare, right? So what do we do? Um, the posterior probability also depends on the test accuracy. How often uh, does the test correctly report uh, a negative result for a healthy patient, right? So that's really what you care about. False positives and, uh, and the like. And how often does it report a positive result for someone with the disease? Determine this two distribution of all. So this is essentially 
probability of negative giving you healthy, probability of positive giving you your healthy, probability of a negative test giving you got the disease. Uh, I mean, obviously these are massive numbers. I think this is just to sort of prove a point, obviously, right? So test one patients. Let's uh, let's try. If I test one patient from the population, uh, okay, so this is my population. They're like they're actually jiggling about a little bit, especially when I jam them. I jam them. They sort of shuffle. I love it. So there's a few people with a disease, and that's probably this 10%. See, if I just jam it all the way up, everyone's red, everyone's got the disease. If I just make it 99, there should be eventually just a couple of people which are healthy. Actually, let's, let's have a nice clean world. There's only very few people which are walking around in red <laughs> with the disease, right? Uh, and then obviously we can actually play around with our test results. So we want our test to be very accurate and um, we care about these two. We want to make sure that that's what makes a good test is these two numbers being high, right? So if we test the patient, he he was blue, he doesn't have a disease, should ideally in 90% of the times actually come out with the correct result. But test the remaining, I'll test the whole population. These are my negatives, these are my positives. So this is my false positive. This guy here, this guy in red, he came out with we told, we said it was negative. He didn't have the disease, but he's red. He actually does have it. So, I mean, that's your inaccuracy in test. Here, positive. There's actually, it's a big fat mess. Um, broadly, sort of 50-50. Not a very sort of good, uh, good test. Also, if I jam that up, make everyone, everyone should be sorted correctly if I do this, right? Blues to the left, reds on the right as you expect, right? This is an ideal world. Everyone that does the test gets exactly what they should have. Amazing, this is cool. This is really, really nice. Uh, big fan of this. And then we can compute this table um, based, on, uh, based on the above, love it. All right, likelihood function. So here we got these, uh, let's go for, Statistic likelihood function is a very precise definition. Concept of likelihood plays a fundamental role in both Bayesian and frequentist statistics. The so probability of observing that data given these parameters. Um, so what's the likelihood of these parameters? So on the left, you've got the likelihood. So what's the probability uh, that these parameters were generated from this data? And then we sort of flip it. Um, probability that these this data was generated by these parameters. Choose a sample size, N sample ones. So I'm gonna sample a value. So that's my, my density. Use the purple slider to, that's gonna be my likelihood. So it's very likely, if I say, if I pick that here, my, my likelihood is, is, is the is highest point. So that's really when you hear the terms like maximum likelihood, we're just trying to optimize that value there, um, rather than saying, okay, well, it's actually likely that the, the parameter um, the theta is uh, sort of sitting here. Well, actually, should be sitting there. That's why it's at its maximum. What if we do loads? Sample loads. Okay, that's my density. Where does my maximum likelihood sit? That's like my average. Beautiful. Now, oh, this is really nice. Um, that's my likelihood function. So, essentially, we want to maximize it around there. Amazing. Prior to posterior. All right, the core of Bayesian statistics is the idea that prior beliefs, so prior is essentially information you do before the test even happens, should be updated as new data uh, is, uh, is acquired. Consider a possible bias coin uh, that comes up with heads probability P. Purple slider determines the value of P, which should be unknown in practice, right? You don't really know what that is. Pink sliders control the shape of the initial beta prior distribution. Uh, let's have a look. Let's flip the coin 10 times. What, that, what does that look like? So we should approach that value there. This P should change my, I'm actually making a bias right, right? And what is this, this distribution here? It's my prior, what I think is probably more likely to sit one way or another. So there's a whole world of prize that you can really pick to try and really just shift like the weight of where you think the parameters should sort of be. If I flip it, it's sort of, it's actually not bad, you know? Um, it does get there in the end. That's actually pretty cool. Really nice. Um, I think there could be better better examples than this, but uh, overall, you know, pretty, pretty nice. All right, quick one. I know this is a, it's a long video. I'll um, make it really quick, I think. 
there's something else after this regression last one obviously we finish on regression the most advanced topic in statistics is clearly regression ols everyone needs a little bit of ols all right ols uh ordinary least squares approach to regression allows us to estimate the parameters of a linear model right so it's just a straight line through some data the goal is in this method is to determine the linear model that minimizes the sum of squared errors so we have this penalty term which is essentially we've got a line of best fit and any deviation from that line you get penalized twice as much oh sorry squared as the distance right so we create these sort of squares around the data um explore the ols model through the four infamous data sets infamous in the anscom quartet never heard of it choose one of the number one all right got some data x and y looks like i got a regression line and some values here n 11 so 11 observations uh, x bar is going to be my mean of x uh, y bar is my mean of y seven and a half so beta zero is the intercept three. So that's where that sits. And beta one is your slope. Okay. Can I do anything? Four. Oh, so that's the regression point. That's the actual observation. I can move the observation and that changes the weighting. So this square is what it's trying to minimize and it's try, trying its damn hardest to make sure that this line a line makes that square as small as possible, all right? But I can just do something silly, like maybe like a smile, bring that down, bring that down, you know? So you've got points which, and this is obviously where OLS sort of breaks down, right? Because you've got most of the data sitting down here, a couple of points up here, these outliers if you must, and they're saying, well, actually the line's sort of completely flat. Let's sort of try and adjust that a little bit, make that, beta one, let's make it zero. There we go. All right, so all this data sits down here, two points up there, completely flat. Obviously your SSC, your um, sum of standard error is massive. Essentially, I guess it's the sum of all these squares, right? Um, so it's huge, huge, huge. I can make that smaller, put it on the straight line, that SSC should shrink. This is awesome. Um, different data sets, let's have a look. Oh yeah, so that's clearly very non-linear. Uh, you can probably transform the data and that's probably what I would do. This one here, okay, you've got that outlier. And number four, everything's sitting on top of each other. So you can't really sort of regress it. There's nothing really there to do. Very, very cool. Correlation, all right. Uh, I guess another super misused uh, tool in, uh, in stats. Correlation is a measure of the linear relationship between two variables. I guess uh, that's really what it is. It's trying to fit a straight line between things. Defined as a sample of the following and takes values between plus and minus one inclusive. Cool. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. All right, these are all the definition. Uh, it's like the you know, deviation from the mean squared. All right, and the can also be understood as the cosine of the angle formed by the OLS line determined in both variable dimensions. And this I don't know. Satosa. All right, I got Satosa. All right, so I've got a correlation matrix here of Satosa, length, width. Let's pick 74. So you're telling me that I regress these two against each other and the line that is formed the cosine of the angle is 0 0.74 wow all right if i had to take one takeaway from this like i have never heard of this this is amazing um how something visual like this and you know we put in regression and we're putting like and i'm sure there's a very nice proof somewhere of why that is so but let's look at something else 18. um do a calculator trigonometry all right i mean let's look i'm, I'm not a natural i don't have cosine in my head right so what's that let's call that 70 degrees so if i go 70 cosine right, maybe not 
34. So maybe that's, let's pick something else a little bit easier. Okay. I'm doing something wrong, which has happened before, um, which is fine. You know, haters, trolls in the comments, boost my video. Uh, look, awesome. If uh, That's something I didn't know and I look more into that, but that's really cool. Analysis of variance, ANOVA. Ah, oh, this just takes me back. Um, don't really do this much in real life. Well, I don't anyway. Um, testing whether groups of data have the same mean. Um, let's have a data. We all love a bit of iris data set. Can't change what's going on. I guess there's like an F probability treatment error total. Drag and drop data points and explore how this affects. Ah, so I can actually change this and this essentially saying, oh yeah, do the p-value, but the f-statistics, f-stat, yeah. Mean squared error, degrees of freedom, sum of squared errors. Essentially each of these has a sum of squared errors, each of them. And then we have a p-value of rejecting it. The same mean, well, I would say, no, if I drag this up, you know, these are clearly not the same mean, so I guess that is rejected. Cool, home. Look, that was awesome. Um, chapters about, there's a book. Really cool, um, long video, sorry. I just got lost in the in the visuals. I really love this visual stuff where you can interact and you know, there's obviously hugely popular channels which we aspire to, you know, three blue, one brown. Um, they sort of take it into the next level. You look at the view counts and you go, look, you're clearly a, uh, uh, appealing to an audience far bigger than just us geeks that do this on a day in, day out basis, you know. The, the concepts are, are simple to understand when you can people can see them visually. Um, I think this is a great start. Um, you know, obviously it could be better, but you know, I love to be able to do more things like this for my channel and make things that are interactive for, for people that maybe don't want to code, they just want to drag and drop and do something like this. Love to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, what do you think of you know websites like this where people obviously clearly many months of work into making them happen. Um, if you'd like to see more things like this from me, maybe on uh, dirtyquant.com, which I love for you to like go and register and sign up and have a chat. Um, but if I made that website, obviously more interactive rather than just the typical Python notebooks, which I do. All right, catch you on the next one. Cheers, bye.